Richard Koch, it's really amazing to see you here outside of your monkey suit uh, in, in uh, relaxed mode. I was at Starlight Classics, which was at now just a week ago, and it, it's become a phenomenon. It really has. And during uh, the COVID lockdown, people were really disappointed. Of course, that we couldn't do it. We were disappointed because we lost a lot of work in that time. But the public were very disappointed because it is a sort of highlight once a year here and once a year in Cape Town. 1999, when you put it together. Yeah. What was the thought process there? Well, it was uh, very interesting. I don't know if whether you remember, but um, in 1994-5, one of the first things that the SABC did after opening uh, up was to bring in McKinsey to do a sort of survey. And one of the first things they did was to say, you shouldn't be running an orchestra. In those days, it was the National Symphony Orchestra of the SABC. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they, uh, they told us then, you're out. No more funding. Thank you, McKinsey. Thank again. you, McKinsey. <laughs> and, and they were to visit even worse on us in this country to wow. come. But, yeah. but I remember, maybe let's just go back there, because this yes. was just after I left the SABC. Yes. There was a beautiful uh, auditorium. Yes, that you still used there. That, yeah. It's still yes, there. Yes, so Studio M1 was our home, and it was actually built for the orchestra. And the, the SABC had had an orchestra since the 1950s. Or even before, actually, uh, broadcasters had an orchestra from about 1929 onwards. When broadcasting first started, they had a small ensemble, which grew over the years. So um, we, we were quite well established. Funny enough, in 1987, the SABC retrenched the orchestra for the first time. Not many people remember this. They retrenched the orchestra and it joined with the packed orchestra. And for five years, they signed a contract for five years to have what was then called the National Orchestra. And it was a sort of double-sized orchestra because it was packed and the SABC. It didn't work from day one, but the contract was for five years. And it was from December the 1st, and from December the 1st, 1991, the orchestra came back to the SABC. There was a slightly different regime at the SABC, and a chap called Veinant Harmsa. He was my boss. Yeah. Was he? He was, yeah. <laughs> he said, we want the orchestra back, and they asked mm. me to run it. So from 91 until the end of 99, I ran it. Some years, few years, we had funding from the SABC, and then that fell away because of McKinsey, thank you. And uh, we then struggled for about four years on finding support from the public and from the corporate world until it became pretty obvious that it was just too much money and we couldn't continue. I left in about August, in fact not about, I left in August of 99 and the money finally ran out in January of uh, 2000. And so where did Starlight Classics Get going. Starlight Classics was part of that process. I went to see Lori Dippenar at RMB and I said, this is the situation with the orchestra. This was in 1998. And he said, I, I won't give you money for the orchestra, but what I will do is give you an opportunity to perform. I will pay for it. And I tell you, the sort of place I want it is the Country Club Johannesburg because we're interested in those clients and we want to entertain our own clients. And we started off with one night. It was called Blankets, Baskets and Bow Ties. And it was just myself and a couple of people from the orchestra who put the whole thing together. RMB obviously did the baskets. We did the rest. And that's where it started. And do you know that the very first one was rained out? It was on a Sunday evening uh, and it was pouring it was late in September, it was pouring, and the bank f let all their clients know, and almost all of them came on the Monday night. And then they realized that they were onto something special. And the next year it was called Starlight, from uh, Starlight Classics from 1999. That was 1998. 1999, 
it became Starlight Classics because they suddenly realized, gosh, we must be onto something if people are prepared to come on a Monday night after being rained off on the Sunday. And genius. they did. Mm. And it's been, from then on, it's been a huge success. And, and a stroke of genius by you and by Lori Dippenau. If you consider uh, yeah. it, it's how many times have you performed? You take COVID out, is it 21? 20? Well, it's 25 years 25 since 98, yeah. Extraordinary. Yeah. And it's very different today, though. I've, I've been privileged very enough different. to go over many years, yeah. and there wasn't that much classical music. <laughs> and we get complaints about that. People say, you know, it's called Starlight Classics, and yet there's not so much classics. And it has morphed over the years. In fact, when I look at the programs now from 1998, it was light classics. We always had a couple of soloists, singers, or whatever, violinists, and um, it was light classics. It's now morphed into much more of a, like a pop concert. I don't know if you remember the, the days of high felt pops. Uh, do you remember those days? They did, they did those concerts at Kluifendal. Yes. And those were real pops concerts with a couple of things like uh, O Fortuna from uh, Carmina Burana put in, or the flower duet. It was a bit like that. So it was a bit the other way around. It was pop concert with a couple of classical numbers. This started off the other way around, and it's become more and more pop now. Are you a frustrated pop singer or pop <laughs> star? Because if you're a musician, presumably yeah. at some point in your life, in your career path, you had to choose classics and the SABC yeah. orchestra or uh, to become the next Rod Stewart. Yeah. Well... Um, I'm, I'm happy to do any of that. Frankly, whatever draws audiences in. I, I really love working with an audience. And for those people who've been to Starlight Classics, you will know I always put in something for them to do. And uh, I love working with a big audience. I don't mind if they're there for the pop music. If we can put some classical music in, this is a good thing. Uh, and actually, the, the formula has worked over the years. And w when we started with the Heifeld Pops at Klofendal, actually, it brought more people to our symphony concerts. So there was, a, there was a strict divide in those days. And it definitely brought more people to our symphony concerts. And in fact, in the 90s, we moved from one night at the City Hall to two. And it's interesting to note that that has stayed two until now. After COVID, uh, the symphony concerts have gone back to one night. Hmm. Why would that be? Well, I think people have got out of the habit of going to symphony concerts. It's quite a social event. Um, and people have got out of the habit of going out because during lockdown, actually on YouTube, you could just press a button and you could have the best of pretty well any orchestra you wanted in the world. They all put stuff up free. Berlin Philharmonic, London Symphony, all of them put free material up and you can get the best in the world just sitting in your lounge. It takes an effort to get up, go to a concert, you know, put on a jacket and tie or whatever it is that you want to do or just stay as you are. But get in your car, go to a concert. It takes an effort. And uh, I mean, it takes an effort to go to Starlight Classics as well, uh, although it's less of an effort because usually there's good entertainment and and free food. Free food always works, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, I, I think maybe for us to just to retrace a little, yeah. we served on the board together at Classic FM. Yes. Uh, I remember we came in as MoneyWeb many years ago, rescued the station, we put a lot of money into it, got it on its feet, was going well. And sadly, it's, it, it's fallen off again. What, what happened from your side? Because you were a board member, and I, yes. and I loved serving on that board with you, and we'll yeah. talk about that in a moment. But uh, was there no way that, that Classic FM could work in South Africa? I think there was a way. Um, and sadly, it didn't happen, as is pretty obvious now, because now it's hot FM. But I think what happened, there, the model towards the end was just not working. Uh, the former owner thought it could be done on sponsorship rather than advertising. I think advertising was always a problem because it had a small um, LSM, I don't know what the highest level of LSM is. It would have been 10 plus. <laughs> 10 plus. Uh, it had a small audience of very high LSM people. And 
uh, somehow they never broke into that advertising market for some reason. I was not in charge of advertising. Mm. Uh, I was just uh, had some programming input. And uh, it's, it went downhill. They added more talk, um, which absolutely didn't work because people wanted to listen to music. In fact, I think one of the problems was that it became a sort of wallpaper type radio station where people just wanted to listen to non-stop classical music. And you can get that in other places now. And I think slowly people dribbled away listening to wallpaper classical music, which you can find on DSTV channels or you can find, you can get BBC. I, a lot of people went to BBC Channel 3 radio uh, and listened to classical music there. And if you're online, you can get it all easily. Mm -hmm. Radio is very special, I think, in that it is available to a wider range of people in South Africa. Not everyone has online facilities. And anyway, it slowly dribbled away. Um, Hot FM said they were coming in and they it went into business rescue. Uh, Hot FM took it over, but it was pretty obvious that what they wanted was the frequency. And as soon as they got permission from ICASA, to change the, the format somewhat, they did, and all of us were basically out. So you're not on the board anymore? No, it's gone. I mean, and all the staff, the old Classic FM staff have gone as well. It's now Hot FM. I, I remember your ideas uh, that, that we did implement. Now, we're going back a long yeah. way, but, but one of the things was gospel and choral, mm -hmm. and there was a huge market that, that was available that wasn't really being properly serviced. And I remember going into that on your yeah. initiative, your creativity. It, it, it would seem that yet another contemporary adult, what adult contemporary music station, uh, maybe they're doing well, but th there might be a place still, might have been a place. I definitely think there's a place. And the, the number of people who still, this is now a year down the line, a year and a bit down the line, still people are saying, please, can't we have a classical music radio station? So I think there is still opportunity for it. But wh what about you? You, you, as you told us at Starlight uh, Classics, are from Abeja. Did I get that right? Nearly. <laughs> <laughs> a little more deeper. Gebecha. <laughs> Gebecha. Yes. Okay. And, <laughs> and, and yet, and you've chosen a very difficult path. Uh, if you consider classical music in a developing country, uh, which it just appears, we hear a lot about people in the arts struggling. What, what, what kept you there? Because uh, I know from personal experience, you could have gone into business and, and, and made a success anywhere else in life. Why did you stick with this area? I think because I love it. I just, I'm crazy about music and I want to share that love that I have for it with other people. I've been hooked on it since I went to senior school and started singing in a choir. The prep school that I was at near Port Elizabeth, Rebecca, had no music at all. I only got into music when I went to senior school and there was a choir and a chapel. It was at Bishops in Cape Town. There was a choir and a chapel. I started playing the organ. I sang in the choir uh, and I was completely hooked on it. I, I can't say why, but I think it was something to do with the director of music who was an inspirational person. And I just, I got locked into that as soon as I got there. And uh, I've just loved it ever since. I've been involved with choirs and music making since I was 13. And the voices of South Africa, they talk about the Welsh being having beautiful voices, but my goodness, as we saw from the Ndlova Choir, yeah. uh, the, the, the voices that are here in this country yeah. are, are world champions. And yet, They're world champions. Why can't we unleash that potential? It is being unleashed, but not here, funnily enough. It's, all of our potential is moving away now because there are more opportunities elsewhere. So all our, I can't say all, but a lot of our best opera singers are now performing in Europe and America uh, because that's where the opportunity is. You know, they've got, in Germany, I, let's say there are 80 opera houses. Here, we're lucky if we've got one because opera has more or less withered away now, except in Cape Town. 
It's an interesting point there because while I was in London when we were setting up our business there, I was invited by the Cape Town Orchestra to an event at Christie's, uh, the, the the auction house, yeah. um, where Mick Davis, I yes. recall, was He's a great Gabe, supporter of theirs. Yeah. Great supporter of theirs, and and uh, and he was, he and many other billionaires were there, promoting the Cape Town Orchestra through purchasing art. So it was, okay. and they, and part of their whole plan was that they would take raw talent, train them, and give them a. Uh, a, a venue into the international market. So clearly it's working. Clearly something's working there. Yeah, it's it's a struggle though. Um, Cape Town, are they've kept going, uh, thanks to people like Mick Davis, who's put some money into it. Uh, the Rupert's put money into it. And for them, it's working. And there's uh, there's quite a support base for Western classical music in Cape Town. Quite a big support base. For example, when we do Starlight Classics down there, uh, we do it at Vergelegen in Somerset West, and there's a big German community who, who swallows who mm -hmm. live in that area. And when you walk around the the grass, big lawn before the concert, there are lots of people speaking German, and th the the sort of foreign element in the Western Cape. I mean, I, I don't know quite how to say that, but there are lots of people who come there for, say, three or six months a year, and they are great supporters of opera, ballet, symphony music, which we don't quite have the same here in Joburg. And you do the Johannesburg uh, Starlight in September and Cape in March. February, oh, February March. February. Yeah. Is there a difference in the program? There is. And it's, it's a subject of some conflict in the the group which puts the whole thing together because it's not just me there's a whole committee that does it there's a director rmb is the producer me a whole team and for example we say le let's take vusi nova for example who works extremely well in joburg because he appeals to the joburg audience i'm not sure he would work in cape town I mean, I'd be interested to to explore that. And I think we will explore that, having had him now in Joburg. The, the next meeting we have will say, mm -hmm. should we have Vusi in Cape Town? I think there is a slight difference uh, in what we promote in Joburg and Cape Town. Is it more classical music in Cape Town? I think so, yes. Now, talking about popularizing classical music, and clearly it happened here for a period with Classic FM, I don't know if you've been exposed to Mozart in the Jungle, the series on Prime, Amazon Prime. No. But it was about, it's about a, f a fictitious uh, conductor called Rodrigo, who's based on Gustavo Dudamel. Yes, I know uh, who he is. And, yeah. and a magnificent, it's gone into its fourth season yeah. now and very, very popular. And that has brought a lot of people into Mozart, yeah. obviously, in the, uh, and in, into, that, into the genre. Are you seeing any growth in classical music consumption in South Africa? I think there was. I think Classic FM filled, fulfilled that function. Um, I, to be frank, I don't see a lot of growth. I think there is growth, funny enough, in, in the black community. We are definitely getting more members of the black community coming to concerts now. And we are consciously uh, performing with more black players, because there are quite a lot of black players available now, particularly string players. But we, So we're trying to make the orchestra look more South African, more, um, yeah, more... Representative. Representative. Yeah, but the there has been yeah. a Soweto string quartet. That's been around yeah, for there, a long time. And there was a Soweto symphony orchestra. In fact, we heard about that um, at this starlight, because... Kutlana Masote, who was conducting. So we had four conductors this year. Also to, to bring new faces in, because, you know, I'm not going to be around forever. We need to start looking at, at other people now. I'm sorry to say, but <laughs> this is the hard truth. And um, I mean, I'm not sorry that they're there. I'm just sorry that I can't carry on no. forever. Um, and he, Michael Masote used to run the Soweto Symphony Orchestra, 
Soweto String Quartet, a Soweto Youth Orchestra. And uh, in fact, when I first came to South Africa, the Soweto Symphony Orchestra used to play, this was in the 1980s, used to play at a festival in Botswana. Uh, although I had not heard them play here, which was interesting, in the 80s. And when I you think say you came to South Africa, this is after studying abroad. After studying abroad, yeah. So I, I mean, I was abroad. born here. Mm -hmm. I was born here and I studied here. And then I went to live in England for eight years. <clears throat> I studied there for a year and then worked there for seven years and then came back. I see in, in Wikipedia, the font of all knowledge, that you studied church yeah, music. Yeah. I, was a, I was a serious church music buff. Uh, uh, I was an organist. Uh, well, now I'm the assistant organist of St. Luke's Church in Orchards, where my wife is the organist. So when she's not there, then I go to play at St. Luke's. But I haven't played now for two and a half years because she was, we were here. Um, Are you deeply spiritual then that you, you got involved in church? You know, it's a, it's a question uh, people often ask me. I, I think I was more, uh, I, I think I am spiritual. I'm not so religious but I am a spiritual person. And uh, that life actually attracted me. When I first went to England, I'd considered entering a monastery. In fact, I went to stay in two monasteries before I started studying. But I pretty soon realized that this was not for me. But what's a monastery like nowadays? It, it, you well, know, I, you think of the olden days yeah. and the dark ages and yeah. that, but do they still cut their hair? Yep, some of them. I, I stayed in a Franciscan monastery and a Benedictine monastery. Uh, very different. And it was actually really interesting. Um, but I'd, it was pretty clear that it was not for me. I was uh, more worldly than that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I enjoyed living in, the, in the, the wider world. But I did take a job working in a cathedral in England, which I did for seven years after my year of studying. And that really fulfilled that side of things for me. And when I came back to South Africa, I became the organist of St. Mary's Cathedral. And that was from uh, 1981 to 1992. It was a tumultuous time in South Africa. And St. Mary's was actually at the center of a lot of that. So the first thing we did, we opened the choir to whoever wanted to come and sing in it. And suddenly we had this big, uh, non-racial choir, whereas it had been fairly white before that. Uh, suddenly it was no longer. It was a completely different concept of choir. And in fact, there were very few non-racial choirs in those days. It was quite interesting. The churches did a lot they did. during the struggle, and often we forget that. We, they did a huge amount. St. Mary's, as I said, was actually at the center of that that sort of uh, cutting edge of crossover. Yeah, it was an amazing place. Richard, what about, uh, I can't not have an interview with a conductor for a business channel yeah. without using those parallels. Okay. And often in business books you talk about, well, you must conduct and not be first violin. Uh, you, you're, have, have you done many of those talks? I uh, have. I've, we, we've done quite a lot of them, and we do it with a small ensemble. Yeah, it's called orchestrating change or harmony in the workplace. I mean, there are all sorts mm. of parallels that you can draw. And conducting a, an orchestra is a, a bit like a corporation because you've got several divisions in the orchestra, people who do the same sort of work, people who do a completely different type of work, but they have to harmonize and work together. The good thing about um, an orchestra is that you've got a very flat structure. Everyone's in the same room at the same time, but it's all about communication, uh, sharing, uh, building relationships, listening carefully to other people, because just a quick example, a flute in the low register you have to adjust the pitch to fit everyone else or an oboe in the low register, whereas in the high register, it's sort of the other way around. So there are many adjustments, sophisticated adjustments that you have to make all the time when you're playing. 
And the orchestra are incredibly supportive of each other in that respect. Um, and you, for people who are uh, attuned to this sort of thing, if someone plays a big solo, let's say it's the cor anglais or the oboe or someone, all the other players quietly shuffle their feet if it's gone well, just to say, well done, keep it up. And, you know, if things start to go wrong, which they do, often things go wrong in the orchestra. Someone comes in at the wrong time. There's a moment of terrible panic in the orchestra when things are falling apart. And then it's the conductor or the CEO's job to pull it all together again very quickly to make sure that it doesn't sort of fall apart completely. And sometimes it does. And the orchestra can come to a grinding halt. Yeah, it's scary. Has it happened to you? It has. Where it's, people just stop playing? They, they stop playing. And it's very, very scary. So what did you do? Well, you just have to, and it's happened, um, we used to do a lot of um, youth concerto festivals where somebody gets, lo the, usually the soloist actually can get lost or come in in the wrong place. It is extremely scary. And then you have to say, okay, we're going to go from here. And you just say, because music is divided up by letters or bar numbers. You just say, okay, everybody, we're going to go from bar 77, one, two, go. Uh -huh. and, reset, and reset and, and go and, and it's very important to get back on the horse once it's you've fallen off mm. no no it does happen I, I was first exposed to this crossover between orchestras and business in Davos and it was an yes. extraordinary uh, experience was it, it was ben Sunday, Zander? Benjamin ben, Zander yeah. Sunday morning yeah. after the soiree as it then was in those days when everybody got to bed far too late and he had a full a, a full group the 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 uh, where he was having the session was absolutely chock full yeah. and the way he he related to these hard ass business people and yeah. politicians and the way he is, evoked emotions from them was was extraordinary he came to south africa afterwards he did and, several times actually. Yeah, yeah. and and was a great fan of nelson mandela's yes but it 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 gave me the the insight into the ability for musicians to really make a difference within a world that otherwise wouldn't be exposed to them. Have, so have you had good response from these these talks that you, you we have? We have, and um, we've done them for many different organizations. Um, we do it with a small ensemble of nine people, just because that's more affordable. Uh, in fact, we had a request recently to do one, and I think because now with people resetting after COVID, that's been another really interesting thing that people are having to come together again where they've not been used to being together. And uh, this has provided a challenge for a lot of people. Uh, you know, how do we start working together again in the same room? Um, I think there is, we've had very good response to it, not recently because we haven't done it for mm. two and a half years, but we used to do them quite regularly. Uh, and just show people how it's possible to improve things and change them. And that's why it was called orchestrating change. So many parallels between, yeah, lots. between business, well, yeah. throughout life. If you can get the, the, uh, the parts where they intersect, yeah. it can often be very powerful. So what's the future for Richard Koch? Well, the future for me is, is more of the same. Well, things are starting to open up quite nicely now. This last weekend, we had uh, two spring concerts um, outdoors. During lockdown, we discovered beautiful gardens in Joburg. Because we could do things outdoors, there are fantastic gardens in Joburg, which normally might only be open to members of the garden club or something like that. They are beautiful gardens. And this weekend, we did two open air concerts. We've got another one in two weeks time. We've got, um, uh, well, we used to do a thing called Baroque in the Bush. Uh, w one of the things I've been able to do is to find niche markets for things. Last musical. Night at the Proms? Last Night at the Proms. Actually, Last Night at the Proms, I think, is like history now. Uh, the, the COVID, I think, has killed some things. And I suspect that Last Night of the Proms may be one of those. Songs of Praise still endures. I've been doing that since 1991. Still going on. Where we started in big cities, it's now in places like 
Hrobla's Dal. I mean, it sounds incredible, but Hrobla's Dal is doing songs of praise later in the year. Smaller places, um, Marquard in the Free State, we did a songs of praise. So people still want that. And so I will continue doing that as long as I can. Uh, if we can, I, we are moving away from Last Night of the Proms. People were finding it a little colonial for their taste. So uh, we've morphed it slightly. Uh, it's the same sort of music, but without all that razzmatazz of, you know, land of hope and glory. Although we changed all those words, it was no longer land. It was land of many splendors where we can be free. We changed all those words, but it still has that old feeling to it. And you're still having fun. I, I'm having a lot of fun, and I'm, I will continue to have fun. And I think there is a market for the sort of things that I do. I don't do so many serious concerts now, serious classical, other than with my choir, where we still do serious concerts, sort of Bach passions, oratorios, um, and, and in fact, in, in a few weeks' time, we'll be doing Mozart and Haydn in the mountains. And I think we have to go to where people want to be now. That, that's what I like doing. So we go and do a concert at uh, Champagne Sports Resort for 160 people. And they pay to be there, and we do three days of music making, a bit like Baroque in the Bush used to be. Um, it's a similar sort of thing. And it's, it's fantastic. And people love it. Well, we might well uh, see each other at Champagne Sports Resort because that's the, the Biz News Conference is there. It's, a, it's the home of the Biz News Conference. And the Drakensberg Boys Choir, yes. uh, who you had on yes. Star Art Classics, were there as well. Aren't they something special? They are very, very special. But they also are struggling now. A lot of schools are struggling. Private schools are struggling to get enough kids. I think a lot of kids have moved, for example, away from Joburg to the coast. So the coastal schools are now booming, but the schools here are struggling. But Draki struggled to get enough kids, uh, and I, you know, I, I think they're a fantastic institution. And the the, the boys sang magnificently at the concert. Uh, they're on the up musically. Um, I think a lot of things are on the up musically now, but in a slightly different way to what we were before. I went on last Thursday to the symphony concert of the JPO, and they had a good audience. Uh, it was pretty nearly full. Now, I don't know if we, if we can extrapolate any of that into the country as a whole, but it does feel like there is room for hope again in South Africa. It does feel like something's happening, something's happening. It's, it's not all doom and gloom. Where's, where's your mind around those things? My mind has always been on hope. You know, I like to think that uh, I came to a city called Johannesburg, and I've always been a, a very positive person, uh, and I try to reflect that in the concerts that I do, and when I talk to the audience, as I love doing, taking them on this journey. Uh, and it is a journey of hope. Um, I think there's, there is a future for what we do. It's going to be tough. But I think there is a future for what we do. And I think music has this incredible ability to bring people together and give them a positive outlook on life. And, I, and Starlight Classics, actually, more than anywhere else, we've managed to do that over the years. We've, we've emphasized that uh, Starlight Classics is of Africa. We are part of South Africa. Um, and, and we can do it all together with these amazing performers that we have. And it's a really positive message that we put out through music. And I think music does have a, an incredibly positive message for people. And I would like to think that I can continue for many years yet with that positive message and bringing people together in, in love, actually, for what we do. Maestro Richard Koch and I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com.